At the Nestle Nutrition Institute, we have one clear vision, to bring nutrition science to life through the people who live it. Connecting a world of healthcare providers, generating discussion and encouraging relevant conversations. NNI believes that the more we promote and grow the understanding of nutrition today, the more we can shape the science of tomorrow. So, we foster and disseminate nutrition research to a global audience, sharing a premium range of resources, offering both scientific and practical information, which is available anytime, anywhere, and covering everything from the first thousand days to healthy aging, from cutting edge science through to sustainable nutrition. To actively establish deeper, more meaningful dialogue inspired by your needs, fueled by your desire to be at the forefront of scientific thinking and ultimately to help you in your professional life. Everything we do is built around you to help bring nutrition science to life through the people who live it. NNI, advancing science for better nutrition. Hello and welcome to today's Nestle Nutrition Institute webinar, HMLs, human milk oligosaccharides, a window of opportunity or a strong weapon in strengthening immunity. I'm Hania Szajewska, I'm professor and chair of the Department of Pediatrics at the Medical University of Warsaw, Poland. It will be my pleasure to moderate this webinar. HMO stands for human milk oligosaccharides, the third largest component in human milk. Approximately 150 HMOs have been described. Many benefits of breastfeeding, particularly protection against child infections, may be at least partially related to the presence of HMOs. Among others, the postulated effects of HMOs include prebiotic and anti-adhesive antimicrobial effects, modulation of intestinal epithelial cells, and immune modulation. HMOs are known for years, but they are discovered again. And you may ask yourself, what is behind current interest in HMOs? And there are many files, but in, among them are advances in analysis of HMO using novel techniques, progress in biotechnology, which nowadays allows to produce at least some HMOs to be added to infant formulas, and finally, formal acceptance by EFSA and FDA. Both regulatory bodies independently confirm the safety of 2LFL and LLNT when added alone or in combination to infant, follow-on, and young child formula. So today, during the webinar, webinar, among others, we will provide answers to frequently asked questions related to HMOs in breast milk. And the learning objectives for this webinar are to review the latest clinical evidence on addition of HMOs in infant nutrition, to learn on the potential of HMOs in reduction of allergenic sensitization and allergy prevention in infancy, to review the results of the first clinical trials using HMOs in infants with cow's milk protein allergy, and finally to discover the science of HMOs beyond 2FL and LLNT, showing the benefits on gut, immune system, brain development, and bone health. This NNI webinar has five presentations, 15 minute, minutes each to be given by five excellent speakers, experts in the field of human milk oligosaccharides. All today's webinar presentations were recorded. However, all speakers will be available for live Q&A session, which will start immediately after the last presentation and will last for half an hour. Those, we invite your comments and questions please look at the Q&A box on your screen. If you think of a question for the speakers at any point, just type it and uh, I will hold it for the discussion portion 
at the end of the event. NNI will be able to share a link with you after the event is complete. We welcome you to revisit the content yourself and to share it with the colleagues. If it happens that not all the questions will be answered during the Q&A session, the speakers will record the answer and you will be able to listen to them once a link is shared with you after the event. So, with no further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker. The first speaker is Professor Lars Bode, and professor is a professor of pediatrics in the Division of on Neonatology and the Division of Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition. The Lars or Rosenquist Chair of Collaborative Human Milk Research and Director of the Larson Rosenquist Foundation Mother Milk Infant Center of Research Excellence at the University of California, San Diego. Dr. Boder received both his Master of Science and PhD degree in Nutritional Sciences from the Justus Liebig University, Gießen, Germany, and completed a pre-doctoral fellowship at the Institute of Child Health, University College, London, UK following a postdoctoral fellowship at the Stanford Barnham Previous Medical Discovery Institute in La Jolla, California, Dr. Bode joined the University of California, San Diego, where he is now leading a research program dedicated, dedicated to investigating human milk oligosaccharides biosynthesis and functions with potential benefits for infant and adult health. And today, he will talk about the science of HMOs, what they are and what they do. Professor Lars Bode, please start. Hello, my name is uh, Lars Bode. I'm a professor of pediatrics here at UC San Diego. And today I'm going to talk about the science of human milk oligosaccharides or short HMOs, what they are and what they do. So um, we're gonna take a little bit a deeper look into human milk oligosaccharide structures and their potential functions. Uh, I'd like to start out the presentation with a quote from the editorial in a recent uh, Lancet breastfeeding series that says that the death of 823,000 children and 20,000 mothers each year could be averted through universal breastfeeding. And that comes along with economic savings of 300 billion US dollars. And for us, the question really is, why is that? And how does this all work on a molecular level? What is in human milk that makes it so powerful to save lives? So if we lift the curtain of the statement here and we take a look at the macromolecules that we have in human milk, you see there's protein, fat, the milk sugar, lactose, but there's also oligosaccharides, five to 15 gram per liter, which often exceeds the amount of total protein. If we compare that to bovine milk, there is about 100 to 1,000 fold less oligosaccharides, the structures are less complex, and since bovine milk is the basis for most infant formula, we have hardly any of these human milk oligosaccharides in infant formula. Now, what are human milk oligosaccharides? Let's take a quick look at their structures, and no worries, it's not going to be as complicated as it uh, seems on, on the slide here. So oligosaccharides comes from the Greek oligos and saccar, a few sugars, and I'll show you uh, why we talk about a few sugars. So when we talk about sugars, this really comes to mind at first. And in the infant space, maybe that looks a little bit more like this. We talk about sugar, we don't really want to have sugar or too much sugar in the infant's diet. Um, and uh, this specific sugar, the table sugar on a chemical structure level looks about like this. Now that's not the sugars that we're talking about here. That's not human milk oligosaccharide. Human milk oligosaccharides are way more complex than the usual and common table sugar. Here's a structure of a fairly simple human milk oligosaccharide, and you'd be shocked to see all these complicated structures uh, all the time and having to draw this out and having to explain this uh, based on these structures. So what we do is we give every building block, every monosaccharide building block, a specific symbol here, and then put those symbols together, and that makes it much easier to talk about. Really, there's only five building blocks that make human milk oligosaccharides. There is glucose and galactose, NSN2-glucosamine, fucose, and silic acid. And this is almost like Lego bricks. 
depending on how you put these monosaccharide building blocks together or the Lego bricks together, you either get a small car or you get a small plane. And we know that cars and planes do different things. And it's the same thing with oligosaccharides. The structure determines the function. Depending on how you put these building blocks together, you get different molecules and these different molecules do different things. On this slide, I'm going to show you what we call the HMO blueprint in the left upper corner, and then a few examples in the white space around it. So all oligosaccharides start with lactose at the reducing end, which is glucose and galactose in a beta-1,4 linkage. And then lactose gets extended by disaccharide units in different linkages. Uh, they can be branched and further elongated. So you see the backbone here gets fairly complicated already and fairly complex. All these oligosaccharides we call the neutral oligosaccharides, non-fucosylated. And you'll see in a minute why it's important to distinguish that. So we can also add fucose to these backbone structures in different linkages. And you can see if we add fucose in an alpha-1,2 linkage, we get two fucosylactose. If we add fucose in a different linkage, we get three fucosylactose. And then if we add fucose to the growing chain, we, we get different structures, different names, different isomers, different functions. So now these oligosaccharides are still neutral, but they are now fucosylated, so they contain fucose. To add more complexity to the story, we can also add silic acid in different linkages to the oligosaccharide backbone. Silic acid introduces a negative charge. It has a carboxyl group. That's why we now call these oligosaccharides acidic or silated. We can add silic acid to lactose to get three and six silic lactose. And we can add silic acid to the growing structure and again, get structural isomers. And we can add more than just one silic acid so the structures get more and more complex and quite different. So again, these are the silated oligosaccharides or short, the acidic oligosaccharides. And then it gets uh, one more step more complicated when we add both silic acid and fucose to the oligosaccharides. So now we have acidic silated oligosaccharides that are also fucosylated. In general, we have about 150 to 200 different human milk oligosaccharides that have been identified so far. And the important point is that every mom makes a different set of different oligosaccharides at different concentration. You see that here an example from the Canadian child cohort, where so far we've analyzed 1,200 samples and it ranges on the very left from fairly low total concentrations to on the right, very high concentrations, different colors being different oligosaccharides. And you can see already how different oligosaccharide composition is between different moms. If we take these oligosaccharides all at 100%, then even here in the relative abundance, you see the striking difference in oligosaccharide patterns between moms. So this is almost like a thumbprint where every mom makes a different set of different oligosaccharides and that changes uh, over the course of lactation. It doesn't change that much though in a smaller window. So here's data that uh, we haven't published yet where we looked at the daily variation of oligosaccharides in a specific mom. And you see over the course of a week, seven days, the oligosaccharide composition stays fairly constant. And then we went down even closer in resolution and looked at an hourly vari variation. And again, uh, between um, base six o'clock in the morning and 12 noon, you see the oligosaccharide concentration is not that different. It is, however, different between different moms. So you see here is a different mom that we collected uh, daily on a, on, a, on a week basis, and then also hourly. And again, it's constant within the mom, but very different than the composition in the mom above. This graph here shows a what we call principal component analysis of human milk oligosaccharides. Uh, this is data from about 10,000 milk samples. Each dot here represents one milk sample's oligosaccharide composition. The closer the dots are together in this three-dimensional space, the more similar the oligosaccharide composition in those two samples. And the further apart, the more dissimilar the oligosaccharide composition in these two samples. Now, these samples have been collected really from all over the world, mostly, of course, from North America and Canada, where we are located. Uh, but really, we have fairly good representation uh, from different continents, different countries. Striking is this clustering of human milk oligosaccharide compositions in this left and right here. And uh, we found out that, that this clustering is related to a single nucleotide polymorphism. 
So in other words, it's just one base pair that is different in mom's genome that drives very different human milk oligosaccharide composition. And without going into too much detail here, this is what we call the secretors and the non-secretors. So there's some oligosaccharides that can be made, other oligosaccharides cannot be made, but then you know, some other oligosaccharides pop up instead, and we really have this clustering of, of two different oligosaccharide uh, composition profiles. Strikingly, this is different in different parts of the world. So there's a geographic component to human milk oligosaccharide composition. You see down in Peru, for example, uh, there is almost all moms uh, being secretors, uh, 98%, whereas um, in, in the uh, Washington site in the US and in some sites in, in, on the African continent, you have 30-35% uh, of moms being non-secretors. So they have a very different set of oligosaccharides. So that is just one example how genetics drives um, uh, human milk oligosaccharide composition. Uh, we've also looked at how maternal nutrition or exercise, for example, shapes human milk oligosaccharide composition. Just to give you one example, this is data from a paper that just got accepted in Nature Metabolism, uh, where we take mice and we have them on a normal diet and they're sedentary in their cage and we can measure uh, the oligosaccharide concentration in mouse milk. There's really only two oligosaccharides, mainly 3 lactose. And then we put this animal on a high fat diet and we see that the 3SL concentrations in the milk go down. We can then train this animal, not with weights, but on a treadmill, and you really see that the 3SL concentrations go up. And if you combine those two different interventions, so high fat diet and then train the animal, see that those two effects compensate for each other. And we've seen, and that's reported in this paper as well, that a very similar mechanism is uh, happening in humans as well. We've seen that maternal probiotic use during pregnancy changes oligosaccharide composition. We don't know much about maternal health or maternal drug use, and these are all open questions of how maternal factors drive human milk oligosaccharide composition. But the important point really is not what drives oligosaccharide composition. The important question is, well, how does human milk oligosaccharide composition affect infant health and development? And I'm going to talk about that during the remainder of this webinar. First, what happens to the oligosaccharides when they get ingested? Well, they make it into the infant and are resistant to the low pH in the stomach, pancreatic and brush border enzymes, and they make it intact in the, um, in the colon where they get degraded uh, by bacteria or they get excreted intact and you find them in the diaper. Important, about 1% of the oligosaccharides gets absorbed in the small intestine and appears intact in the urine. So the entire system really gets flushed with human milk oligosaccharides. What do oligosaccharides do? We know that they serve as what we call prebiotics, so as a preferred metabolic substrate for specific uh, microbes in the infant gut that have some health benefits. But at the same time, we think that oligosaccharides are more than just food for bugs. We and others have shown that oligosaccharides are antimicrobial, so they keep some of the bad bugs in check. We've also seen that bacteria in many cases need to attach to the epithelial surface, and we can block that with oligosaccharides. We call that the anti-adhesive effects. Oligosaccharides have direct effects on the epithelial cells in the intestine, and that might have an effect on the microbiome as well. They have an effect on the underlying immune system, and immune cell responses. And again, that can have an effect on the microbiome in the intestine. So that's local effects in the gut. But since I mentioned that they are also absorbed and reach intact the systemic circulation, we also think that there is systemic effects. And last but not least, really, we think that this is just the tip of the iceberg. There is so much still to discover on what oligosaccharides do and how they function. How do we study human milk oligosaccharides? Well, there is really a whole array of uh, studying oligosaccharide function all the way from in silico, in vitro models, in tissue culture, uh, then moving into animal models, uh, eventually doing human cohort study analyses where we have cohorts collect milk samples, analyze oligosaccharide composition, then associate the data with infant outcome or maternal factors. And then last but not least, we have intervention studies where we do randomized clinical trials to test the effects of oligosaccharides in infants, but also in adults. And all this is happening on a background of a network of multidisciplinary collaborators from really around the world.
I'll give you one example that really is best explaining how this pipeline works, and that is in the context of necrotizing enterocolitis. We know that necrotizing enterocolitis is still a fairly common and deadly disease. The preterm infant, about 5% of all very low birth weight infants develop NEC, um, and about a quarter of them or more will die from this devastating disease. On the other hand, we know that preterm infants who receive human milk are the six to tenfold lower risk to develop necrotizing enterocolitis. So now what is in human milk that protects the infant from this disease? Is it human milk oligosaccharides? And to present data from the last 12 years, probably in one slide, uh, what we've done is we started isolating human milk oligosaccharides from pooled human donor milk to get the entire garden variety of all oligosaccharides known so far and test that in an animal model of necrotizing enterocolitis. Then we found that, yes, the pool is actually working. It improves um, uh, patho pathology and survival of the animals. And then we separate the oligosaccharides by different structural features and subfractionate them and subfractionate those again and then identify which is the most effective oligosaccharide. And in this case, we found that there is an oligosaccharide called DSLNT, which is short for disilyl lactoen tetrose, that has the best effect in this animal model. We then explored the chemical space around this oligosaccharide. Still, DSLNT is the most effective compound. And then wanted to see if this data really holds up and translate to human preterm infants. So we designed our own uh, cohort study in preterm infants, recruited uh, 200 plus mother and their preterm infants, collected milk samples every second day, analyzed them for oligosaccharide composition, and then associated that with risk to develop necrotizing enterocolitis. And lo and behold, we found that there was a match. So the oligosaccharide that was protective in the animal model is indeed in lower concentrations in those milk samples that were given to infants that later developed necrotizing enterocolitis. So low levels of those oligosaccharides are associated with increased risk. Giving this oligosaccharide to the animal model um, improves survival and lowers the disease. So that for us is a good uh, uh, combination to inform randomized clinical trials, but also tells us that the animal model isn't that far off and we can use that to study the underlying mechanism. So here's one oligosaccharide that works. If you take another oligosaccharide, it doesn't work. If you remove a silic acid from the end, the effect is gone. So this is highly structure specific. So we want, found one specific human milk oligosaccharide that is associated with lower neck risk in the cohorts. Uh, we found that the same oligosaccharide improves survival and neck pathology in an animal model. This is a great opportunity to develop new therapeutics, but it's also a great opportunity to screen mom's own milk and donor milk products, so there is a diagnostic opportunity in this space. So that's just one example, and I think it highlights really how preclinical models and cohort studies can inform clinical interventions, uh, and that's really what's needed to fully understand the role of human milk oligosaccharide. There's other examples, and I'm going through them, through some of them, uh, real brief. Uh, one is in the context of diarrheal disease. So infectious diarrhea is one of the main causes of death still in infants and children under the age of five. And looking at the anti-adhesive and antimicrobial effects of oligosaccharides, uh, groups have found that 2-focosolactose, 2-FL, for example, has an effect against Campylobacter, against enteropathogenic E. coli and enterotoxic E. coli. And that has been shown both in tissue culture, in animal models, as well as in cohort studies. Uh, we have seen that LNT, lacto and tetraose, has an effect against group B streptococcus. And that's both in tissue culture and we have new data in animal models as well. Uh, LNT also has an effect against the parasite and amoeba histolytica. We've shown that in tissue culture. 3SL and 6SL have an effect against rotavirus. And this has been shown both in tissue culture but also in animal models. On infant growth, there's a few examples as well. We've seen in multiple different cohorts that the oligosaccharide 2 focosolactose is associated with infant growth. And it's not just this oligosaccharide, it's really the ratio of 2FL with LNNT that has the most predominant effect here in association studies. So it's the ratio between 2FL and neo-LNT that is important. And we've shown this in multiple different cohorts, uh, both here in the US in a pilot study in Denmark, 
as well as in a large cohort study in Finland uh, in the STEPS cohort. Other studies have shown that 3SL and 6SL seem to be um, effective when it comes to growth during malnutrition. Very elegant paper here that was studied that looked both at a human cohort as well as at animals. And then uh, there's also examples how different oligosaccharides impact neurodevelopment and cognition. 2FL, for example, was shown in animal studies to have an effect on memory and learning. And we've just recently published that in a human cohort, the same oligosaccharide 2FL at one month of age concentration is important to predict cognitive development at 24 months. Then there's many, many other studies, and I'm only highlighting one review paper here by Wang uh, that showed that silated oligosaccharides, so 3SL, 6SL, potentially others, have an effect as well on memory and learning. And there's good data on, uh, from animal studies as well as from cohorts. Last but not least, uh, we also see that oligosaccharides impact immune development. So, for example, defocusial lactose, uh, abbreviated either DF lac or DFL, uh, impact cytokine release in tissue culture. Uh, we have recently shown that 3 sal lactose is very effective to block chronic inflammation, both in tissue culture as well as in animal models. And uh, if you want to hear more about this or read more about this, there's a very good review in Frontiers and Pediatrics uh, by my colleague, uh, Vasilis Triantis. Um, very interesting when it comes to immune development, though, is that very often in association studies, we find that it's not one oligosaccharide that is associated with improved outcome. It's usually a mix of different oligosaccharides. And we've seen this uh, for cow's milk allergy. Uh, we've seen this for food sensitization. And we've recently published a paper um, that also looked at allergic disease in the MAX cohort, very elegant MAX cohort, collected samples in the 80s. So these uh, infants now are in their mid 30s. Uh, and we have these long-term outcome measures, and we see that it's not one single oligosaccharide that is associated with improved outcome. It's really a mix of different oligosaccharides. So to wrap this all up, uh, what are human milk oligosaccharides and what do they do? They are the third most abundant solid component of human milk. Uh, they're a group of complex sugars, or glycans, and there's about 150 different ones. They can be small, like the trisaccharides 2FL, 3FL, 3SL, or 6SL, or they can be larger and more complex branched elongated structures. They can be either neutral, so not carry silic acid, or they can be acidic, carry silic acid. Then they can be fucosylated or non-fucosylated. And HM, HMO structure is important because it determines, determines HMO function. Uh, not all HMOs do the same thing. It really is a structure dependent uh, um, effect. And very important, HMOs are not digested by the host, by the baby. Uh, so there is local effects in the gut as well as systemic effects after absorption. And many of these effects are mediated uh, by the microbiome in the infant gut, but also we've seen that there is microbiome independent effects. HMOs are prebiotics, anti-adhesive antimicrobials, epithelial cell modulators, immune cell modulators. HMOs can affect outcome like infectious disease and diarrhea growth, neurodevelopment and cognition, immune system development re and responses. And again, this is very likely just the tip of the iceberg, so much more to discover. We've seen that sometimes we need specific individual oligosaccharides to be effective. Those effects are highly structure specific and follow a dose response. And the mechanisms are likely receptor mediated. So either on the host or on microbes, if the oligosaccharide doesn't fit because its structure is wrong, there is no effect. Other times we find that we need specific mixtures. So it's really the composition that matters and the relative abundance or ratios of HMOs to each other. Those mechanisms are likely indirect through shaping microbial communities or complex immune system responses. And uh, in any case, we do need a combination of preclinical cohort and clinical trials uh, to fully assess and validate the effects and functions of human milk oligosaccharides. And the other speakers will go into that in more detail. And I leave you with that. And I look forward to questions at the very end. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Sagar Takar from Singapore.
Sagar Takar is a research scientist at Nestle Research Singapore Hub, translating lactation science, maternal nutrition, and early life nutrition to relevant product and service offerings. Before his 10-year career of Nestle research, at Nestle Research, he was trained as a general physician in India. He then moved to the United States for further education on human nutrition. He did his master's in clinical nutrition from New York Institute of Technology and a PhD in human nutrition from the Ohio State University. He has authored more than 30 scientific publications, book chapters, and review articles, and is also involved in organizing international conferences on human milk sciences. Today, he will talk about lactations for infant feeding expertise focus on HMOs. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. And it is my pleasure today to talk to you about the Lactation for Infant Feeding Expertise, the LIFE initiative that we have at Nestle. And of course, I'm going to focus on HMOs today. Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to this platform, a virtual platform where you all are listening to us and to talk about the science of human milk that I'm very passionate about. So without further ado, let's get into it. Um, I'll start with my disclosure. Of course, I am an employee of Nestle Research with a research focus on human milk sciences, uh, maternal nutrition and early life nutrition. So having said that, let's jump into this very interesting topic of human milk and HMOs. So before we get into all of that, uh, it is no surprise to this audience that there are a lot of benefits of breastfeeding. There is benefits of mother-infant bonding, short-term benefits, long-term benefits, and to both infant and the mothers. So no surprise that many agencies around the world, including WHO, American Academy of Pediatrics, etc., promote exclusive breastfeeding during the first six months of life and even then continued breastfeeding with the introduction of appropriate complementary feeding. So before I get into the, all of that, I want to give a snapshot of what is LIFE. LIFE is Lactation for Infant Feeding Expertise. This is a program that we have at Nestle where uh, we have understanding of, and it's a compilation of all human milk research programs and projects that we have. So I would like to tell you a little bit about that. The objectives of our program life are rather clear. So it is to better understand the human milk in relation to the nutritional needs of the infants, in relation to the infant growth and other developmental outcomes, and nutritional requirements of breastfeeding mother. Now, how do we do all of this? So we have multiple studies. We have actually a much big global footprint of our human milk studies actually that is going on in about 16 uh, in 16 studies that are carried out in about 20 countries and within these 20 countries we have recruited with our clinical partners in those individual countries about 2000 mother infant pairs and some of, a majority of these studies are longitudinal and therefore we collect more than just one a human milk sample and we understand the evolution during the lactation stages. So we have uh, collected approximately around 8,000 human milk samples. And I also want to talk about what makes our initiative very unique because I want to stress that all of our studies are using standardized protocols so we can compare from study to study and these protocols includes uh, human milk collection protocol as well as the sample analytical protocols. Uh, now if we talk about the analytics side, we have developed from scratch and validated in-house uh, samples, uh, so, sorry, uh, methods for multiple human milk analysis and we are with that, with those um, uh, methodologies, we are able to characterize about 200 human milk components and we understand that to date this is one of the largest and the most comprehensive global initiative of its kind uh, run by industry. So uh, 
with all of these data and samples, we have accumulated about a million data points uh, that we can use through big data analytics for understanding in depth the human milk. I'm going to now talk about some of those data that we have acquired in the last couple of years. So the focus is now on human milk oligosaccharides. Uh, uh, there is a big team of glycobiologists and that is actually behind the scenes doing a lot of work. It is my pleasure that I represent them today and share some of the work that they have done. So without further ado, I'll go into uh, what are human milk oligosaccharides, how they look in relation to the other macronutrients in the milk, etc. So life team, uh, our team has characterized and quantified HMOs in about eight prospective cohorts from 15 countries. Uh, some are still in progress, so more data to come later. Uh, to date, we have analyzed close to 3,500 samples of human milk for HMOs. Of course, we have a much larger database and maybe we are in the process of uh, exploring the others, but this is the data, the extent of data that we have today. And we have explored a uh, number of drivers that are responsible for the concentration of HMOs in the mother's milk. So the first one I want to talk about is maternal genetics, right? So this is a data from a study that was done in Singapore. This was done with 50 subjects. Uh, this was a longitudinal study of three time points. And in this study, we analyzed five different HMOs. So the key message I want to give you here is that 2FL, which is the most abundant HMO, was actually dependent on the food to status of the mother. So if you see on the first graph on the top right, you will see clearly two different groups forming based on our data. There is a flat line towards the bottom of the x-axis that were actually non-secretors that had a very low amount of 2FL. And then you see uh, another line on the top of it uh, with reducing amount or reducing concentration of 2FL at different time points in lactation. So these were from the secretor mothers. So other thing I want to indicate is 2FL and LNNT are the most abundant HMOs. This is visible through the numbers that you see on the y-axis of all the, the five HMOs that we have analyzed in this study. So the other thing we want to say is that negative food to status was associated with the higher LN, LNT and lower LNNT and four out of five measured HMOs reduced actually with the progressing stages of lactation exception made for the 3SL which you see in the on the graph on the bottom left. So we did not observe here any statistically significant differences between the concentrations of HMOs and the infant body weight, length, and head circumference, and the BMI in this study when we did the associations. Second, I want to show another study that we did actually this time in China. And this is where uh, we also saw, saw that HMOs evolves with the stages of lactation. So here you see uh, there were about 540 subjects. Uh, this was one of the exceptional studies because it was a cross-sectional studies, but it was done between first week and eight months of lactation. And in this study, we were able to analyze 10 HMOs. So uh, as you look on the graphs on the right, you see there is a trend of HMOs individual HMOs that are actually decreasing and majority of them are actually decreasing. However, if you look at the second panel on the top, you will see this is the HMO, at least in this study, was increasing. And we saw that there was a strong negative correlation between 2FL and 3FL. When there was a decrease in 2FL in the stage of lactation, there was increase in 3FL. So it gives us into insight. It gives us insights into uh, probably the mechanism of production of these HMOs within the uh, maternal body. Now, moving on, uh, we also looked at uh, gestational age at delivery and the impact on HMO. What I mean by that is we looked at 
the milk comp composition of term and preterm mothers. And this was a, a small study done in Switzerland, 53 subjects. It was longitudinal. Sampling was for eight weeks and 16 weeks, depending on the group. And we had about 22 HMOs analyzed. So the key message I want to give with this slide is that the majority of the HMOs that we looked at in these 22 did not differ whether the, the infants were delivered term or preterm. However, there are two, 3SL and DSLNT, they were higher in the preterm milk at equivalent postpartum age. And these were significant at multiple time points during lactation. So this is what you see on the left-hand side of the panel, uh, uh, both top and bottom. Moving on, uh, we also looked at mode of delivery impact on HMO. That, what I mean is we looked at the mothers that were delivering the baby normally, vaginally, or by C-section. And this is actually seen in one of our biggest studies. And this study was in seven countries in Europe with about 290 subjects with uh, six time points longitudinal milk collection and again 22 HMOs analyzed. So the key messages we observe in this study is that maternal pre-pregnancy BMI or the overweight women actually had mod modestly higher amounts of 3SL and 6GL. Mode of delivery also had an impact and the C-section mothers had actually lower amounts of 2FL, 3SL, and 6GL. In this study, we also explored parity, whether it made any difference if mother was delivering the first child or a second child or a third child. And uh, here in this study, we did not observe any statistically significant difference after correction for multiple testing. So we learned a lot from this study and we continue to learn more as we go along. Uh, before I end, I just want to transition my talk to my colleague's talk, Karin Blanchard, who is going to talk about um, preclinical evidence of HMOs. And here I just want to show two different benefits that our team is looking into with a lot more details. So here we have preclinical evaluation of long-term effects of HMOs on growth and adiposity in the model of adult obesity. This work is done in collaboration and is led by Jose Manuel Ramos, that, whose picture you see on the top right corner. He is a great scientist, glycobiologist in our team and has led this work. So what I wanna say here is that they have done a study in Gothenburgan mini pig model of adult obesity to evaluate the potential long-term effects of HMO supplementation on the growth, body fatness, and its distribution. And uh, there is the study design that you see on the left side that the different group of uh, mini pigs were given different combinations of HMOs. Uh, and uh, the mini pigs was selected because uh, as you see on the right-hand side, uh, that those milk contain all the oligosaccharides that are also found in mother's milk in humans. But we did not select rat because the rat had only 3SL and 6SL. So very quickly to uh, the outcomes of this study. Actually, uh, in this study, we did not observe any effects of HMO on growth or uh, feeding efficiency or uh, final body weight, length, and abdominal circumference based on the difference group. So in a nutshell, it did not have any impact on the growth, at least in this model. Now, secondly, to show you a little bit about the HMO and the cognitive development. So here we are looking at uh, a study by the group of Lars Bode, and he probably may have presented this, but just to remind you that this is the only uh, clinical study that exists associating human milk oligosaccharides to the cognitive outcomes in humans. And here it showed a positive impact on, on the infant cognitive development uh, 
at 24 months depending on the concentration of HMO consumed at one month. Now, continuing that, another scientist at our center, Jonas Hauser, whose photo you see on the top right corner, has actually done in parallel two different models. So a mice model, uh, and you remember from the previous slides that mice has actually only uh, two HMOs in their milk. So what they had was access to uh, six SL knockout mice. And in these mice, they, uh, they did some cognitive development tests. And so actually the results you see here uh, is on the attention, but we of course have more results and they will be published and presented in due time. Uh, so here you see that if the mice did not have 6SL, they actually were very much prone to error in their attention. So you see the black bar is much higher and significantly different with the control. So in absence of 6SL, there was more error uh, in the cognitive development uh, tests. So in the piglet model, you will see that on the bottom, uh, the acquisition tests were done and then the reversal was done. And basically the conclusion of this uh, experiment with the piglet model was that presence of C-allylated HMOs in the milk had better outcomes on the cognitive performance. All right, with that, I move on to the last slide and the summary. So HMO is the third most abundant component of human milk by dry weight. Approximately 200 HMOs have been detected, about 160 have been identified, and out of those, about 30 quantified. Uh, a combination of actually five HMOs that are 2FL, LNNT, DFL, 3SL, and 6SL represent actually three different families of HMOs, but they account for nearly 50% of the total oligosaccharides in the milk. Some of the drivers of HMO concentration in human milk are maternal genetics, stages of lactation, gestational age at birth, mode of delivery, and the pre-pregnancy BMI. At least in our preliminary data that I have shared with you, we have found no long-term effects of HMO on growth, feed, efficiency, or adiposity in the preclinical model of adult obesity. And there has been some positive effect on the cognitive functions. So with that, um, I would stop here uh, and I encourage you to ask questions in the forum. And I thank you very much for your attention. Our next speaker is Ryan Carvalho. He is a Global Chief Medical Officer at Nestle University Nutrition Strategic Business Unit. Ryan Calvalo earned his medical degree from the Bombay University in India, and he completed his pediatric residency in New York City and clinical fellowship in pediatric gastroenterology and nutrition at Johns Hopkins University, Baltimore. Dr. Carvalho is a member of the North American Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition and the American Academy of Pediatrics. He has authored several publications in peer-reviewed journals with several of his most recent publications focusing on his study of 2FL tolerance in infant formula. The title of Dr. Carvalho's presentation is Learnings from the Last Decade of clinical evidence of, uh, on HMLs. Hello, and it is my pleasure to present to you today. I would like to start by thanking the Nestle Nutrition Institute, as well as the chair and moderator, Professor Hania Shayevska, for this opportunity. We've already heard from eminent Professor Lars Bode on the science of human milk oligosaccharides, and then learned a little bit more from Dr. Sagar Tucker on some of the benefits of human milk oligosaccharides. During my presentation today, I will focus on the clinical evidence. Let's talk a little bit more about the lessons we've learned from the most recent decade of clinical research on human milk oligosaccharides. My name is Dr. Ryan Carvalho, and I am the Chief Medical Officer of Nestle Nutrition, and these are my disclosures. During this presentation today, we will cover the following topics. 
We know that breastfeeding is the best way to feed a child. During the presentation today, we'll look at some of the clinical evidence of the benefits of human milk oligosaccharides from mother's milk, which reiterates the importance of exclusively breastfeeding a baby through the first six months of life and continued breastfeeding with the introduction of complementary foods through the first two years of life, followed by continued breastfeeding as desired by the mother and the baby. But for the baby who's not exclusively breastfed, we'll talk about some of the clinical evidence related to human milk oligosaccharides in infant formula studies. And finally, we'll end with a sneak peek of the future on what the promise of HMOs may continue to deliver to further the benefit for the babies. So let's start by looking at growth and development. In this very recent study, the abstract of which was accepted to be presented at the World Congress of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition this year, the researchers aimed to explore if there were any associations between human milk oligosaccharides and growth and body composition over the first four months of lactation in an exclusively breastfed cohort. They divided the babies based on the mother's secretor status in their breast milk as secretors or non-secretors. As you can see from their results, they showed that irrespective of whether babies were breastfed with secretor mother's milk or non-secretor mother's milk, babies continued to grow similarly across the first four months. What's more important is that both male and female babies showed no difference in their growth patterns based on the maternal secretor status. These authors concluded that overall HMO concentrations and secretor status did not correlate or predict growth and body composition in healthy, growing, and exclusively breastfed babies. Further, let's look at some of the data on growth and development as it relates to the non-exclusively breastfed child. In a published trial, which was among the premier randomized controlled trials looking at infant formula with two HMOs, 2FL, LLNNT, they looked at a six-month intervention period with an additional six month of follow-up. What they showed was that infant formula that was suppl supplemented with 2FL and LNNT is safe and supported age-appropriate growth as compared to an infant formula that did not contain HMOs, reiterating that the presence of HMOs in infant formula is safe, appropriate, and continues to support age-appropriate growth. In a much more recent study, which is a multi-center randomized control trial along with a breastfed non-randomized cohort being followed, they showed that an infant formula when fed to babies over an intervention period of four months showed no difference in growth compared to an infant formula that did not contain one gram of 2FL. What was more important is that the trajectory of growth of both these formula fed babies tracked closely with that of the WHO growth standards. So this study taught us that an infant formula containing a gram per liter of 2FL in combination with L-ruteri provided appropriate growth and was safe and well tolerated by babies, but babies growing similar to that of an infant formula not containing HMOs and akin to the trajectories on the WHO growth standards. And when talking about growth, it's always important to look at tolerance. Do babies tolerate HMOs in an infant formula? The previous two studies looked at HMOs in an intact protein formula. But what about in a partially hydrolyzed 100% whey matrix? This study, which was a six-week intervention trial in a randomized controlled study done in the United States, they looked at providing babies an infant formula that contained 2FL with the probiotic B. lactis in a partially hydrolyzed whey matrix compared to a control formula that did not contain 2FL. What they showed was over a six week period, looking at the intestinal, the infant gastrointestinal symptom questionnaire, a validated index for feeding intolerance and GI burden was similar between the test and control groups at baseline and after six weeks 
reiterating that an infant formula, in this case, partially hydrolyzed whey with 2-FL and the probiotic B-lactis was well tolerated by healthy term babies. Let's turn our attention now to look at something we've heard from previous scientific presentations on the role that HMOs have to play in influencing the developing intestinal microbiome. In these studies that looked at human milk, they correlated human milk with some of the intestinal microbiome or clinical outcomes related to diarrhea. In the first study that compared the relative abundance of the fecal microbiota of infants who were breastfed by either secretor and non-secretor mothers, they found a higher relative abundance of bifidobacteria and bacteroides, as well as a lower relative abundance of Clostridia, Enterobacteriaceae, and Streptococci in babies who were fed by secretor mothers, compared to babies who were fed by non-secretor mothers, giving us the learning that HMOs can specifically promote the growth of certain intestinal microbiota. In a similar study, looking at different outcomes related to the clinical outcome of diarrhea, Ardith Morrow and the group in Cincinnati looked at the levels of 2-FL in mother's breast milk, and depending on whether they were high, medium, or low, correlated those with Campylobacteria diarrhea or all-cause diarrhea. What they found is that compared to babies who were fed by mothers with lower levels of 2-FL, babies who were fed with higher levels of 2-FL in breast milk had a lower incidence of Campylobacteria diarrhea, as well as a lower incidence of all-cause diarrhea. This again goes to show the role that HMOs have to play in the developing intestinal microbiome, as well as some of the gastrointestinal outcomes. So we've seen the results in human milk studies. Let's look at some of the data from infant formula trials. In this study, which looked at 2-FL and LNNT supplemented into an infant formula with an intervention of six months and a six month follow-up, they looked at the gut microbial diversity or through a redundancy analysis at three months of age. What this shows us is that there is a greater overlap in the intestinal microbiome of babies who receive the infant formula containing 2-FL and LNNT to breastfed babies as compared to the control formula. When digging into this data a little bit more, they found that there was a significant difference in the abundance of specific bacterial genera at three months of age. The greater overlap that was seen between the test formula containing the HMOs and the breastfed cohort was exemplified here by a statistically significant difference between the breastfed and the control group and the test formula group and the control group. The similar finding was replicated in the Escherichia genera data as well. In a more recent study, which looked at two groups of babies in a randomized multi-center double-blind control trial with the breastfed cohort, they found that the C. diff abundance in the test group, which received a formula containing one gram of 2-FL and a ruri, were lower than that in the control group, which received a formula not containing 2-FL at 30 days. What's even more important to realize and learn is that the mean seed of abundance in the test group was no different from that of the breastfed group at 30 days, while that was significantly different from that of the control group. When looking at a subsection of babies in this clinical trial, and that is looking at babies who were born via C-section, they found something that was interesting. They found that while there was no difference between the test and the control formula in the overall population related to Klebsiella pneumoniae, they did find that there was lower Klebsiella pneumoniae abundance in the C-section infants of the test group compared with that of the control group at one month of age. Realizing the important learning that HMOs can have a significant impact on the intestinal microbiome. And similar to findings that were seen in the breast milk observational studies, some of the randomized control trials have determined interesting differences in the proliferation of specific preferred microbiome and a decrease in abundance of certain pathogenic intestinal organisms.
Now let's look at immunity. When looking at immune health, one of the studies that was done looked at the role of various respiratory as well as medication use in children who received a formula containing 2FL and LNNT, two HMOs, as compared to a control formula without any HMOs. What they found in this randomized control trial that infants receiving HMOs had fewer reports of bronchitis through four, six, and 12 months, lower respiratory tract infections identified through an adverse event cluster through 12 months, lower use of antibiotics through six and 12 months, and lower use of antipyretics through four months of age. In a trial that was done in the US with the primary outcome looking at tolerance, they actually looked at some of the adverse events classified by system, organ, and class, and identified that there was a trend which did not meet statistical significance of so fewer infections and infestations in the group that received an infant formula containing 2FL as compared to those in the control group. When looking at some of the mechanisms, we understood its role in influencing the microbiota. In another large study that was done in the United States, looking at three different intervention arms, one that contained a control formula with only GOS, and two others with different levels of 2FL in combination with GOS, they showed that infants fed 2FL supplemented formula had similar levels of plasma inflammatory cytokines compared to those of the breastfed infants, which was different from those of the infants who received a control formula that did not contain 2FL. So let's look at some of the newer benefit platforms that are being explored for HMOs. A growing body of research, primarily in preclinical models, has shown an association between certain ciliated HMOs like 3SL and 6SL, and more recently, fucosylated HMOs like 2FL and neurocognitive outcomes. In this study, the abstract of which was to be presented at the World Congress this year, researchers aim to explore this association. In their observational cohort, what they found was a positive association between 3SL and receptive as well as expressive language. This was measured using the Mullen score of early learning. So what does the future lead us to hold? With over 150 HMOs which have identified so far, we know that the future looks promising. Currently, there are ongoing studies looking at a blend of five HMOs from three of the more predominant categories of HMOs found in mother's breast milk. In this five HMO trial, which uses a combination of fucosylated, non-fucosylated, and ciliated HMOs like LNT, 2FL, LDFT or DIFL, 3SL, and 6SL, researchers are hoping to see their impact on growth, safety, and tolerance as well as some of the more clinical outcomes associated with respiratory and gastrointestinal health, while measuring some biomarkers for immune development, maturation, and the developing intestinal microbiome. But we know that the science has evolved, particularly when it comes to feeding preterm babies, and newer evidence highlights even further the distinct characterizations of certain HMOs and their role in preterm mother's breast milk, as well as for preterm babies. In an ongoing trial, they're looking to see the impact of a supplement of 2FL and LNNT at a ratio which is similar to that found in preterm mother's breast milk to understand and explore the potential outcomes in preterm babies. And finally, we know that there's an observational cohort looking at the correlations between diet, human milk, and neurocognition particularly studying cognitive and behavioral outcomes using modern technology like MRIs in a longitudinal cohort of zero to five-year-old children. So in conclusion, the clinical evidence of the most recent decade, combined with years of research, teaches us that breastfeeding is the best way to feed an infant, and that new science highlights the unique diversity of HMOs for each mother-infant dyad. We also now know that the clinical evidence of benefits of HMOs ranges from establishing the developing microbiome and supporting the developing immune system to more promising benefits in early areas of neurocognition. There's a rapidly growing body of evidence 
that specific clinically studied HMOs, when added to infant formula, have shown functional benefits beyond growth and development. And finally, the future of scientific discoveries of the importance and benefits of HMOs provides promise that will continue to help all of us support to nurture a healthier generation of children. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Our next speaker is Karine Blanchard. Karine Blanchard field of expertise is allergy. She was a faculty in the Cincinnati Children's Hospital and Medical Center, Ohio, USA, in the Division of Allergy and Immunology before she joined Nestle Research Lausanne, Switzerland in 2010. She works since on how nutritional intervention can prevent allergy development in infants. Today, she will talk on HMOs and allergic sensitization. What is current evidence? Good morning or good afternoon. It's my pleasure today to uh, present you um, the, da the data existing in the current literature regarding human milk oligosaccharide and allergic sensitization. Allergy is um, a public concern, uh, affects a lot uh, of our population, and most half of the population will be sensitized in a few years. We know that it's still increasing, and what's uh, very interesting on, in this figure is to see that it's not only the prevalence that is increasing, but also the, the, the severity of the symptoms. And you see in the last three decades, this uh, drastic increase in food allergy, eczema, and allergic sensitization, which is rising. So how is that possible and does early life set the trajectory? Uh, we have become very bad, bad host to our microbes and we know that microbe is very, uh, and microbiota is very important to actually set this early trajectory because it's at the start of life uh, that the relationship between the gut, the microbiota and the immune system is uh, being established. This has been a particularly uh, well um, shown in, um, in, uh, aller in the context of allergic diseases in uh, murine models uh, using two different approaches, either the antibiotic treatment or the germ-free mice. In both cases, when you induce this uh, drastic change into the microbiota composition, you actually see this uh, very drastic increase into allergic sensitization here measured by um, Ig um, level in the serum. And uh, in the context of human milk oligosaccharides, this has been uh, linked first by the, um, the group of uh, Norbert Sprenger et al. in Nestle Research Center that have de demonstrated that there were an association between C-section born infants and uh, the food to dependent HMOs. Uh, he actually identified a trend toward an association with Ig allergic disease and Ig eczema in C-section born infants what it could not actually see when it was looking at the whole population. And that's what you see nicely when you separate the vaginal and the C-section born infant. Now, if you only look at the C-section born infant and the level of 2FL in the mother milk, you definitely see um, this association, this significant association between the level of 2FL and the, um, which is protective um, in, uh, for Ig allergic disease or for Ig associated eczema in this study. Other study come from the preclinical data, and here you have uh, the, uh, a mouse model showing that 2FL or 6SL can actually protect against food allergic symptoms. It is a model of um, intestinal anaphylaxia induced by ovalbumin. And you see here that either or 2FL or 6SL uh, is able to decrease allergic score. The author were able to identify that one of the mechanisms behind this uh, decreasing score may be linked to uh, mast cell degranulation in this model. 
uh, recent data have uh, identified that the 3SL was also protective against allergic symptoms. This was done in this publication uh, in scientific report in 2020 in two different murine models where they um, nicely show a dose-dependent effect on allergic sensitization and also on mast cell numbers. We have followed the same path in another model, cholera toxin model, where we identify a, a dose response effect of HMO mix 2FL plus LNNT at preventing allergic sensitization, here measured by IgG1 levels. But uh, interestingly, it was a bell shape effect, and at 10%, the effect was lost. We mirror this data with uh, a regulatory uh, lymphocytes in um, MLN. Uh, at 5%, we could see this nice increase into the level of this regulatory cell that was lost again in 10% uh, HMO, uh, showing again this bell shape effect of the HMO. However, when we look at a mast cell level or a serum MMCPT1 here shown in this graph, in this model, we actually identify that at 5 and 10% supplementation, you had a significant decrease in MMCPT1, which here was not bell shape, but really a nice dose response curve, suggesting different uh, possible mode of action behind this effect. When we look at what could happen on a gut, and this work was conducting by um, uh, under the lead of Clara Garcia in the Nestle Research Center, when uh, barrier integrity was looked for in the context of um, uh, human milk oligosaccharide, uh, they could show that uh, it confer resistance against uh, inflammatory induced intestinal um, epithelial barrier dysfunction in vitro. You see here that a, a mix of 6-HMO can uh, decrease the barrier leakiness induced by the cytokine in a dose-dependent manner. While here, when the HMO are uh, plotted individually, uh, 2FL was definitely the most efficient at protecting the barrier integrity, and um, this may be uh, involved in our cholera toxin model. When the metabolite derived from human milk oligosaccharide fermentation was observed, here again a work done by uh, Jen Natividad under the direction of Clara Garcia, she could find that uh, they were a protective effect of this uh, HMO fermentation supernatant on the epithelial cell barrier. Uh, integrity, uh, here again looked by uh, FD4 translocation. The mix of uh, 6-HMO or 2-FLLNNT were potent at decreasing, um, decreasing barrier leakiness induced in this model. And these uh, two mechanisms, whether it's a direct effect of 2-FLLNNT or the indirect effect through the metabolite, might be um, effective in our uh, cholera toxin model. Uh, indeed, another model in the gut is to be considered because it involves mast cells, and that's the visceral sensitivity um, to distensions, which is obtained in the water avoidance stress model. In this model, what was observed is that uh, the mix of 6-HMO, LNT plus 6-SL, or 2-FL and DIFL was able to decrease uh, visceral sensitivity to distension, suggesting that a different mix of HMO might have different uh, activity in gut or immune uh, models. Now, uh, to actually bypass the effects that HMOs mixed with LNNT could have on the epithelial barrier, we actually look at another model, which was the epicutaneous sensitization model, where the allergen was exposed to the uh, rodents through the skin. Here again, we actually seen this nice decrease, dose-dependent decrease uh, into the sensitization at 1%. However, at 5 and 10%, here again, we lost the effect, suggesting again a bell shape effect um, in the context of allergic sensitization with uh, the mix of 2FL LNNT. When we dig a little bit more into the microbiota composition in order to see what could be associated with this effect, we identified a drastic change in microbial composition, but also in richness, particularly at 10%. And a specific abundance of some bacteria, like para Parabacteroides or Achaemensia were changed at 1 and 5%, which was corresponding to the efficacious dose that we have been observing either in the cholera toxin model or in the epicutaneous sensitization model. 
we uh, looked also at propionates and shoshen fatty acid uh, production increase in this model. Here we see more a linear increase with a significant uh, a value at 5% and 10% supplementation. Here again, like sensitization and mast cells, uh, we see a, a dichotomy between the, the, the efficacy and the dose of the model with some of the readout which uh, follow a bell shape with the uh, efficacy which is lost at higher dose or uh, a very linear increase or decrease into the effect. And all this suggests different mechanism of action. When you look at human data, um, you uh, can see that there is some studies that have been trying to associate the uh, human milk level to uh, cow's milk allergy, for example. And this uh, very nice study from Sepo et al. shows that there is some association uh, between some level of HMO and uh, cow's milk allergy. And that was here uh, DSLNNT, 6SL, uh, LNFP1, and LNFP3 that were found as relevant in this cohort. However, in other cohorts, here looking at food sensitization, this Miliquenal paper have been not successful at finding linear association in univariate analysis linking food sensitization to the level of, of, of um, HMOs in breast milk. What they did, however, is uh, looking in a profile of several HMO together, and the overall HMO profile needed to be considered when examining the health effect of HMO. They identified that 10 HMO could be actually relevant to predict uh, food sensitization in their in their cohort, which was quite interesting for us uh, because we did similar approach in a German cohort, the live child cohort in collaboration with Leipzig Institute. And we uh, aim at uh, looking at the association between HMO and allergic outcome. What was um, um, important in this cohort, it was that it was uh, 156 mother pair uh, infant uh, mother infant pairs, uh, where we had several collection points, uh, 3, 6, and 12 months, and we uh, quantified up to 25 HMO in this cohort and performed univariate and multivariate analysis. Similar to the Milico paper, we did not find any uh, significant association, linear association uh, of uh, increased level of HMO with allergic outcome or protection. Uh, however, we looked at multivariate analysis and uh, we did correlation matrix. So correlation matrix are difficult to interpret. So we used uh, graphical discovery analysis to try to identify cluster of association or intern dependency between the different components, but also immune marker. And here, this uh, analysis, uh, graphic graphical discovery algorithm allow us to identify a nice cluster between the HMOs in orange and the immune marker like TGF-beta-2 IgN, the mom sensitization. Uh, that's actually um, reveal again the close uh, interrelationship between the immune system and the HMO composition. When we look at uh, multivariate analysis, we also identify um, quartile um, association. We looked at the different levels that could actually be linked to a potential beneficial effect on uh, allergy prevention. And the interesting thing is that for 2FL and for LNNT, we identify that intermediate level of HMOs in the breast milk was the most protective uh, against allergic sensitization in infants suggesting that specific dose uh, might have different uh, efficacy also in human uh, condition. Uh, of course, when you consider human, I mean, it's uh, always an allergy. It's always a, an interaction between the genetic and the environment. So uh, we had the... Um, the opportunity to look at a polymorphism in infants and uh, at more specifically looking into the food gene. We look at food 2 and food 3 gene polymorphism and we identify one SNP in food 3 that was uh, significantly associated with sensitization of or uh, allergy. We uh, link that also, we are trying 
today to link that with the level of uh, 2FL and 3FL which are in the mother milk because we know that depending on the uh, enzyme status you will actually produce different level of 2FL or 3FL. Uh, the SNP was done in the infant so it's a little bit tricky to link that back directly to the mother but there might be some, um, some uh, direct um, bias of the genetic uh, into the either the allergic association uh, through or not the breast milk level and that's something that we are trying to decipher at the present time. There is a lot of people that work on this, uh, on this study uh, and I would like to thank them all uh, before I go to my conclusion. Uh, so um, what we have seen today uh, is that HMO 2FL LNNT decrease allergic sensitization. Uh, that regulatory T cell modulation may explain the beneficial effect of HMOs on sensitization. Uh, the, uh, the effect may uh, not only be linked to uh, improve intestinal barrier function, but also on uh, other effect of HMO may have on the immune system. Uh, we have seen that specific dose of HMO 2FL and NNT are associated with lower allergic sensitization in mice, but also in uh, human cohorts. And finally, it's very important to look at polymorphism in the food genes to um, really be able to confound correctly this association uh, in the human cohort. And thank you, uh, everyone, for your attention. That's, this is my acknowledgement slide. Thank you. Our last speaker during this webinar is Professor Ivan van den Plast. Professor Ivan van den Plast studied medicine and trained in pediatrics at the Vrije University, uh, University in Brussels. He became head of the unit of pediatric gastroenterology and nutrition in 1987 and the head of the Kids House Castle at the University Hospital Brussels and the chair of pediatrics since 1994. Professor Ivan van den Plas's main interests are gastroesophageal reflux, diagnostic procedures, treatment, eosinophilic esophagitis, infant nutrition, probiotics and prebiotics, cow's milk protein allergy, functional gastrointestinal disorders, and helicobacter pylori. He has published many original research and review papers on topics such as infant nutrition, gastroesophageal reflux, and functional gastrointestinal disorders. He is now one of the associate editors of the Journal of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition. Uh, he is also the chair of the Espegan Special Interest Group on Gut Microbiota and Modifications. Ivan has more than 450 publications listed in Medline and over 1,000 presentations or representations at different international meetings. And today he will talk how HMOs boost immunity. Hello, welcome to join this presentation on how HMOs do boost the immune system. Before saying anything else, it's of course obvious that breastfeeding is an unequal way of providing ideal food for the healthy growth and development of infants and that every effort should be made to stimulate breastfeeding as much as possible. Breastfeeding, mother's milk, does contain a huge amount of human milk oligosaccharides, which will stimulate the development of the immune system. And that immune system is of fundamental importance for short and long-term health outcome of the baby. The immune system must learn how to effectively discriminate between harmless antigenic substances and possible harmful pathogenic invaders. And human milk oligosaccharides do play a major role in the development of this balanced system. If unbalanced, there is an increased risk to develop allergy and also to develop food allergy. And there is a real epidemic going on by increasing food allergy. So immune system development does have an influence on the risk to develop allergic disease. But allergies 
are complex diseases with multiple causes such as environmental factors, allergen exposure and genetic predisposition. So it is multifactorial and manipulation of the gut microbiota will therefore have a certain beneficial effect but other players do also influence the development of that immune system and so the effect will always be only partial. But again as said in the very first slide breastfeeding is the way to go and to be stimulated. And breastfeeding has of course the optimal nutritional composition. But breastfeeding may influence immune responses through the bioactive immune modulating properties of breast milk or through the impact of breast milk on the intestinal microbiota. So development of gut microbiota is one of the clue advantages of mother's milk compared to non-supplemented uh, infant formula, which will have an effect on the risk to develop allergic diseases. So together with this group of co-authors, we just have this paper in press, which concluded that in summary, there is no clear evidence that there is a long-term increase of the incidence of allergic disease in formula-fed infants in comparison to exclusively breastfed infants. However, there are findings um, which are accumulating, pointing to some specific breast milk compositions which may ensure protection. So dysbiosis induces qualitative and quantitative changes in the microbiota that directly affect immunological mechanisms leading to allergic disease. And so again, it's multifactorial. It's not only mother's milk versus formula uh, feeding, but it's also hygiene, it's also infections, uh, administration of medications, all that will influence the health outcome and will influence the immune response towards inflammation or towards tolerance and determine the risk to develop allergic disease. And these data from Estonia and Sweden show that allergic children are less often colonized with lactobacilli and bifidobacteria as compared with the non-allergic children. And these relatively old data uh, show us also that this difference in microbiota composition exists before any manifestation of the development of allergic disease. So this suggests that changes in the microbiota are primary and not secondary to the development of allergic disease. In other words, the development of a healthy microbiome from birth onwards is of major importance to, def to determine the risk to development of allergic disease. So let's now have a look at the evidence there is on the effect of two of those human milk oligosaccharides, 2-FL and LNNT, on microbiota, immunity and allergy prevention. So this is a clinical observation study which found initial evidence of an association between HMOs in breast milk and allergic disease in the offspring. So there is in fact, not yet consensus as to whether HMO really influenced the development of allergy in infants. And different results of studies and the complexity of breast milk composition make it difficult to identify significant associations. But nevertheless, this was shown that FET2 dependent breast milk oligosaccharides were able to modulate mucosal immunity possibly through the establishment of early microbiota, which in turn delayed IgE-associated eczema manifestations and this in infants born by C-section. So in infants born by C-section, whether they are breastfed by a secretor mother or a non-secretor mother will determine their risk to develop atopic dermatitis. The difference is three times 14% compared to 43% in exclusively breastfed infants with as a single variable secretor or non-secretor mother. So HMOs 
will modulate lymphocyte cytokine production, potentially leading to a more balanced Th1, Th2 response. So again, at two years, but not at five years, a lower incidence for IgE-associated eczema was observed in C-section-born infants who were fed breast milk containing FUT2-dependent oligosaccharides. And as you see in C-section-born infants, IgE allergic disease or IgE atopic dermatitis, for both parameters, there is a trend towards decrease um, depending on the amount of those uh, FUT2-dependent oligosaccharides. The data indicate then that if for the infants born by C-section and having a high hereditary risk for allergies, that they might have a lower risk to manifest IgE-associated eczema at two years, but not at five years, when fed breast milk with FUT2-dependent milk oligosaccharides. And you see at the right part of the slide at the bottom for IgE eczema that the differences are statistically significant. So a higher 2FL level was observed in early breast milk consumed by C-section born infants who did not develop IgE-associated allergic disease. These are data from a prospective clinical trial indicating that the supplementation of infant formula with 2-FL might reduce the, ri the risk of developing atopic eczema again. So during the four-month study period, control group versus uh, intervention group with two different amounts of 2-FL concluded that the incidence of eczema in the groups with 2-FL were significantly lower than in the group with the control formula. In the same study, they also looked at the levels of um, inflammatory cytokines in six-week-old -week infants. And in light blue, you see the levels obtained in breastfed infants. And in light and heavy orange, you see the levels of those cytokines in the infant's which were fed with the two different amounts of 2-FL. And in dark blue, you see the amount of the inflammatory cytokines in infants fed an infant formula supplemented with galactoligosaccharides. And you see that the levels in the infants fed the infant formula supplemented with the 2-FL are much closer to the levels in the exclusively breastfed infant in comparison to the, lev to the levels in the infant fed infant formula supplemented with galactoligosaccharides. So it clearly shows that 2-FL brings the inflammatory cytokine levels in six-week-old infants closer to the levels of obtained in breastfed infants. So HMOs stimulate bifidobacteria growth and metabolic activity in a structure function specific way. Specific HMO does boost metabolic activity of specific bifidobacteria leading to immune protection. So now I would like to report the clinical study examined, which examined the impact of the formula with two HMOs on the establishment of the gut microbiota. It was a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized prospective trial, showing that the phylogenetic diversity of infant formula with the HMOs group was significantly lower compared to the control group and therefore closer to that of the breastfed group, which means that you had more bifidobacteria in the infant formula group supplemented with the HMOs compared to the control group, which brought the HMO formula fed infants closer to the levels of the breastfed infants, so more potentially useful uh, bifidobacteria, and fewer potential pathogens which were observed in the test formula group compared to the control group, again bringing the amount of pathogens in the infants fed the test formula closer to that of the breastfed group and uh, significantly different to the levels found in the group fed the control formula. 
So infants with high bifidobacteria dominated gut microbiota community at three months less often require antibiotics in the first year of life. So it's not only a difference in composition, but also a difference in clinical outcome. This will result in difference in incidence of diarrhea up to the age of two years, difference in incidence of vomiting, difference in respiratory infection, difference in episodes of nocturnal coughing. So genetic variants in FUT2 uh, have an influence on the health outcome of the baby up to the age of two years. So randomized controlled trials fed a st uh, infants, sorry, fed a starter formula with HMO have a lower risk for reported lower respiratory tract infection and antibiotic use during the first year of life. So infants were supplemented with 2FL and LNNT up to the age of six months, but up to the age of one year, there was a decreased use of antibiotics. There was a decreased incidence of uh, infections and um, infestations of the lower respiratory tract, uh, especially uh, bronchitis, which was decreased. Growth tolerance and safety was also reported for an extensive hydrolysate containing the same two HMOs. So, and one of the um, side outcomes, secondary outcomes of this trial was the relative risk reduction for respiratory infection and medication use up to the age of six months. So it shows you that both for lower respiratory tract infection, upper respiratory tract infections, ot otitis media, antibiotics, antipyretics, there was a strong tendency towards a decreased risk of infection. And it was statistically significant for otitis, resulting in a um, decreased prescription rate of antibiotics. And that both for the full analysis set and the per protocol analysis. From the same study, uh, we also could report that respiratory infections and medication use from enrollment up to 12 months of age uh, showed also a strong trend towards protection regarding the different odds ratios. So the hypoallergenity of a whey-based extensively hydrolyzed infant formula contained two, containing two human milk oligosaccharides was clearly demonstrated. More than 90% of the infants tolerated the novel extensive hydrolysate with the two HMOs very good confirming its safety and efficacy in infants and young children with cosmic protein allergy, but also at the same time showing a strong tendency towards uh, protective effects regarding respiratory infections and gastrointestinal infections and a decreased prescription rate of antibiotics. So in summary, um, overall, an observational study in the Finnish cohort showed that there was a lower incidence of trend at two years of age for IgE-associated eczema manifestations in C-section-born infants who were fed breast milk with high amounts of 2FL. In a clinical study in infants fed a formula with 0.2 or 1 gram of 2FL, the control group had a significantly higher percentage of subjects with reported eczema than did the group supplemented with 2FL, we had no, which had no subject with eczema. And finally, in a randomized double-blind controlled multicentric clinical trial, at three months, formula with 2FL, Two HMOs shifted stool microbiota diversity towards those of breastfed infants. And infants with a high bifidobacteria dominated gut microbiota community at three months at less often a requirement of antibiotics during the first year of life.
So HMOs positively influence host epithelial and immune cell responses with documented clinical benefits for breast and formula fed infants. The addition of HMO in infant feeding is a new promising concept in allergy prevention and management. Thank you for your attention. Hello, hello again. And uh, now it's really live session. So first of all, let me thank all the speakers for their very elegant, informative presentations. I hope all of you have enjoyed it. And as promised, now it's time for live Q&A session. It may happen because there were a lot of questions. So it may happen, and unfortunately it will happen, that the speakers will not be able to answer all your questions. So what we have done, the speakers will recall the answers to all of your questions and you will be able to listen to them uh, once a link uh, is shared by MNI after the event. So don't worry if you did not hear the answer now, you can listen to it later on. And now allow me to take the, this opportunity as a moderator. So I have chosen some of the questions. Lars, I would like to start with you. And there were many people asking very similar questions, so which can be phrased like, why are HMO superior to other oligosaccharides, such as, for example, oligosaccharides, galactooligosaccharides, with regard to the immunity benefits? Of course, if you agree with the question. Yeah, I think that's a very important question. Uh, thanks for asking that, and thanks for being on this webinar and having me uh, present here. Uh, so it's important to highlight that GOS forests, for example, are very different in structure. Uh, they're not in human milk. Uh, they don't can contain fucose and silic acid, which is very important for some of the very specific receptor-mediated um, effects. So GOS forests and other oligosaccharides might have some prebiotic effects, and then that translates into effects on immunity in some cases. But oligosaccharides have many other functions as well that are specific receptor mediated independent of the microbiome. And that's where we really need those structure identical molecules like the 2FLs, the 3SLs, the 6SLs, and many others. And those structures are not found in other oligosaccharides like also. Okay, thanks a lot, Lars. Uh, I have another question now for Sagar. And again, there were many people asking very similar questions that allowed me to, to phrase it as follow. We understand from you that HMOs can vary based on geography. Does this impact the proposed benefits? Sagar, please answer. Yeah, thank you, Chairperson, for asking this question, and thank you, audience, for asking this question. Uh, indeed, uh, there is literature, and you, you also heard from Lars's presentation that there is quite a bit of variability geographically, but geography is merely a proxy for the underlying genetic variation. And even if you see there are differences, for example, in Peru versus Washington that Lars had showed, uh, I don't think there are any systematic studies done looking at the same benefits in these two extreme populations on the same outcome. So, one thing is for sure is that we should do more research before we can definitively answer this question. Okay, thanks a lot. Another question which was really asked by many of the viewers is what new benefits do you anticipate from a more diverse HMOs blends in infant feeding? Ryan, if you can try to answer it. Absolutely, I'd be happy to. And thank you uh, for that question, and thank you, Professor Shevska, for the excellent moderation as well. Um, I think we've heard from Lars that the structural diversity implies, in some ways, a functional diversity. So what I'm really excited to see from the newer studies coming out on these HMO complexes or these blends of five different HMOs is levels of continued evidence of immune health looking at clinical outcomes like reduced risks of certain infectious disorders, respiratory or gastrointestinal, or the reduced use of certain antibiotics and reduced use of certain antipyretics. So overall immune health is where I see 
the great potential for further clinical outcomes to, to be explored by this combination of this HMO complex. The second area I think has a lot of potential is in the area of neurocognition, particularly as it relates to the ciliated HMOs. We've seen preclinical evidence in some observational cohort, and I'm really looking for some clinical outcomes in neurocognition. And the final is in the areas of musculoskeletal or bone health uh, is where I expect to see a lot of advanced uh, clinical outcomes coming through. So I'm very excited about the diversity of HMOs finally coming into the clinical evidence arena. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, so if you have young researchers listening to, to you, it seems that there are some work for them to be done. Okay, another question which was very often asked, and I think it's important to address it here. Can you explain why only very specific HMOs are effective in reducing allergic sensitization? And I was thinking whether Karin perhaps can address it. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the question. So uh, I will start by going back to the Lego brick of, um, of Lars. Each structure may lead to a different function. And that's something that we have seen and we are seeing us and others on immune cells. So if you stimulate immune cells with different type of HMO, you will get a different type of answer. And that's a simple answer and it gets even more complex when you start to work with mixes because with mixes you actually um, develop even different response on the immune cells so uh, different function different structure but also different mix maybe different functions so that's the first point and the second point why allergic sensitization well you have to keep the historic we have regarding everything on prebiotic function and the microbiota and how this actually interfere with with allergic sensitization at large and program the immune system early on. And again, the specific effect that this HMO may have on immune cell independently in the direction of a prevention of sensitization. Thank you very much, Karin. It seems that allergy is something that interests really a lot of our viewers because there is another question. Can you expand further why there is a link between gut microbiota and development of allergy? I wonder, Ivan, perhaps you can answer this question. Well, thank you for that good question. I will do my best to clarify it. Um, I said during the presentation, uh, what we know from old literature is that um, children who become allergic have uh, less bifidobacteria and less lactobacilli in their gastrointestinal microbiota than those who do later not become allergic. Um, so that's what we know from uh, all the literature. What we know from recent literature is that with HMOs, you stimulate the development of bifidobacteria, lactobacilli, so they come become they become more predominant, and then through uh, immunological mechanisms, they uh, result in a decrease of allergic reactions. So, what has been shown with the clinical studies is by changing the microbiome, stimulating bifidobacteria, uh, you decrease allergic disease in the children. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Ivan. You know, there are many other questions, so allow me and I please feel free to, to who would like to answer. But important question, again, many people ask similar kind. What are for you the most exciting newly discovered HMO benefits deserving further research and why? Who would like to answer this question? I presume all of you can contribute to it. <laughs> So um, I'll be happy to start and welcome others to join in. I think that I think in um, I think what we've learned from HMO so far is that the promise is huge and the benefit territories continue to increase. So I think further advancing immune health to understand other mechanisms by which they continue to support the developing intestinal microbiome, which may directly or indirectly impact the immune system development and immune health. Neurocognition, I think that the data is really expanding in that area tremendously. I think that uh, future benefits are coming in some of their potential anti-inflammatory uh, benefits as well are continuing to be studied. And finally, I would say that their, their impact on looking at things like overall long-term health 
through the intestinal microbiome and also impacting things like bone health later on in life would be very interesting to see. Excellent, thanks. Uh, is there any one of the speakers who would like to comment on this question? What are for you the most exciting newly discovered HMLs benefits then deserve, uh, deserving further research? Ivan, perhaps you want to comment on it? Well, I'm, unfortunately, I'm going to repeat what uh, Ryan said. I think that the new area is indeed uh, the uh, communication with the between gut and brain, so gut brain interaction, uh, where it's clear that through different mechanisms, uh, as well neural as endocrinological as to inflammatory parameters, um, the gut microbiota seems to have a huge influence on a lot of uh, mechanisms in our body. And so those, this microbiome uh, is very important for every organ system. And cognitive development is now which gets the most uh, attention. Okay. Any thanks, Ivan? Any anyone else would like to add something? Yeah, I would just simply like to mention that uh, something that has not been looked at before in terms of the HMO benefit is its implication in bone health, and this is really up and coming. We are still building the evidence, uh, but I think I look forward to that part of HMO research. Excellent. Thanks a lot. I have other questions, so if I, if I, allow, I think that I'm allow. Um, some of these questions are related to atopic conditions, so perhaps Karim can help us. What are the various atopic conditions you feel HMOs may benefit? Again, this was a question asked by many of our listeners. Yeah, so we don't have a lot of history in this field, I would say, in terms of um, uh, time. Uh, I would, uh, if you screen the literature, you see that most of the atopic disease have been found either in preclinical data associated with a, with a positive outcome when you uh, supplement with HMO, uh, whether it's skin or lung or gut type of uh, sim symptoms. And in human cohorts, you had sensitization, you have cow's milk allergy, or you have uh, atopic uh, Ig associated atopic dermatitis that has been associated to some sort with HMO's composition. So I think there is a lot of potential in the context of uh, atopic disease at large for HMO's. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Karin. Another question which relates to gut uh, to microbiome: uh, How is HMO change? The, uh, how is HMO change the baby microbiome and their whole future from brain to immune system and growth? This is a difficult question. Who is go going to answer? Perhaps Ivan. Well, I'll, I'll start, and I think that. Okay. What seen from um, Lars's data, and I invite Lars to uh, comment after I do as well, to say that we know that HMOs can selectively impact the intestinal microbiome. We've seen from data from a couple of the speakers that it really promotes selectively, in some cases, a very bifidogenic uh, intestinal microbiome. And we know that that really has an impact in long-term health, not just short-term outcomes for the baby, but overall in their long-term health, because of the various relationships and associations that are coming up between the intestinal microbiome, immunity, atopic disorders, and neurocognitive disorders as well. So I think that the ability of HMOs to selectively impact certain bifidobacteria or preferred or desired intestinal microbiota really can have an effect in that baby's long-term health, uh, not just during their childhood, but extending into adulthood. And I know Lars, you've done a lot of work on, on the intestinal microbiome influence, so I'd really encourage you to comment as well. Yeah, that, yeah that's uh, that's that's a very great um, uh, topic to talk about, and we can talk about this probably for another two hours. Um, so so uh, what really has to be kept in mind there is that only very few bacteria can metabolize human milk oligosaccharides to use them as their growth substrate. So that means that some bacteria will be at a very big advantage over other bacteria that cannot metabolize them. And then those bacteria that can metabolize them have secondary metabolites that come out of that 
digestion of oligosaccharides that then have an effect on immunity and many, many other effects. And in addition to that, we also have effects that are independent of these prebiotic microbiome shaping effects. So there you actually want to have the intact oligosaccharide still available. So if you have too many bacteria that can now metabolize all of your oligosaccharides, those effects are potentially lost. So I think it's a very fine balance between having a microbiome that is not too over-dominant by human milk oligosaccharide utilizers, but also have uh, human milk oligosaccharide utilizers to have those secondary effects. So it's really a fine balance how the microbiome and oligosaccharides play together to have these different effects on the infant's uh, in immune system. Thank you very much. There were also some other questions, which I probably, uh, again, uh, favored by many of our uh, participants. What are the most promising areas of HMO benefits in toddlers and preschoolers? But also, there were a few questions, I just checked it, in preterm infants. So perhaps, Lars, I, I presume you may wish to comment on preterms, and perhaps someone else can take it in toddlers and preschoolers. Yes, happy to do that. So I showed you some of the data that we have on necrotizing enterocolitis, which is fairly specific for the preterm infant. And uh, there it's, again, highly structure specific. And uh, there were some questions about the potential mechanism, how this all works. So we think here it's a macro microbiome independent effect where the specific oligosaccharide that we identified uh, potentially triggers responses in epithelial cells, in immune cells directly. So it's important not to digest this oligosaccharide away by bacteria. And, and necrotizing enterocolitis, of course, is a major problem. We have seen in other uh, work that recently got published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition that there's an effect on sepsis as well. Uh, so that's a big problem uh, in preterm infants. And brain development, we've talked about already, that is very important uh, in the preterm space as well as in the term space. Uh, so, so there's lots of different um, aspects in preterm infants where oligosaccharides have uh, a potential role and, and could be very beneficial. Excellent. Thanks, uh, Lars. Um, but there was also a question about toddlers and preschoolers. Any comments from the speakers? Well, I think that um, for this age group, the, the major benefit is like has been shown in the infants. It's uh, a strong tendency towards uh, decreased incidence of uh, respiratory tract infections, gastrointestinal infections, a decreased prescription rate of antibiotics, so a general uh, greater well-being of those infants with uh, decreased incidence of uh, infections. Excellent. Thanks a lot. There were many more questions, uh, and as I told you at the beginning, the speakers will answer all of your questions. They will be recorded and they will be available through the link which NNI will share with you. Uh, there were also some questions about HMOs and COVID-19, as you expected. I did not ask you these questions because I, I'm, not, I sh I'm sure that the listeners are very interested in the answer, and I just want them to come to your recorded answers and probably you will answer them uh, during this session. So uh, with this, allow me to thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Thank you very much, participants, for being with us. It was really, uh, these are unprecedented times where all of us learning how to do it. It's really exciting. HMOs are exciting. We know them for years, but we are discovering them again. It's a lot of fascinating research for anyone who is interested in research there's a lot to do but also for us as the users of of, uh, of of this data so thanks again and thanks a lot for to nni they are some people from uh, nestle and from uh, nestle nutrition institute uh, who are serving as speakers but there are also some people behind the scene so i would like to thank all of you and of course the participants so Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to moderate this session. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.